Good morning. We're going to just wait a minute and then we will get started. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Mary Small and I'm here with Karen Gear, and this is the Coastal Conservancy's Prop 1 webinar. Hopefully, um, it's so weird talking into the void, but hopefully you can see my screen <laughs> and hear my voice. Um, we are recording this and we'll post a recording of it. And um, we blocked out an hour. This probably won't take an hour. I, th I would be very surprised. Um, we'll go through about 20 slides, and then there's time for you to ask questions. Um, the way the webinar is structured, the, for you to ask questions, you need to type them into the question box, um, which is on the side of the webinar screen, and then I'll read them and we'll try and answer them. If we can't get to all the questions, um, we should have plenty of time, but if we can't, we can email answers afterwards. Um, so thank you for logging into this. Uh, the Coastal Conservancy, uh, I probably you're familiar with us, but we're a state agency, uh, and our mission is to work with others to preserve, protect, and restore resources of the California coast, ocean, and San Francisco Bay. And we do projects um, in a variety of scales, so hands-on restoration projects like the pulling ice plant on the left, or major dam removal projects like San Clemente Dam pictured on the right. Uh, this is a Prop 1 webinar uh, about our Prop 1 grants. The current solicitation uh, is for projects that either restore wetlands uh, and or enhance anadromous fish habitat along the north coast. So we're looking for projects located in coastal watersheds somewhere between the Golden Gate and the Oregon border. We expect to have about $6 million of Prop 1 funding and applications are due by midnight on April 1st. Those are the basics. Um, again, the Coastal Conservancy, you, you may or may not be familiar with us. We're a little bit different from most state agencies in that our jurisdiction is the coastal watersheds, but our mission is fairly broad. So we uh, work on multi-benefit projects uh, on a variety of issues, habitat enhancement like this solicitation, also coastal access, uh, preserving coastal agriculture, a uh, whole bunch of, of issues. Prop 1, as a reminder, um, is a bond act that was passed by the voters in 2014. It was a $7.1 billion bond. Within that, Chapter 6 is about protecting rivers, lakes, streams, coastal waters, and watersheds. Within Chapter 6, the pie chart on the bottom shows the $100.5 million that the Coastal Conservancy uh, was allocated. And Prop 1 had part of what this ch pie chart shows, it had a lot of other allocations for a lot of other agencies. And so there are some um, kind of overlapping grant programs. We are trying to coordinate with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Ocean Protection Council and the Natural Resources Agency and WCB. Um, but we also just encourage folks to apply to any grant round that seems <laughs> applicable um, to your projects. Uh, once Prop 1 passed, we updated our strategic plan to kind of identify the priority areas um, that we wanted to focus our Prop 1 funds on, thinking about, you know, the mandate within the bond of that Chapter 6 and our own mandate. Um, and for this solicitation, those two priorities are wetland restoration and um, anadromous fish habitat enhancement. There are some basics that were built into the language of Prop 1, some basic requirements um, that all grants have to be awarded through a competitive process, that the agencies had to develop solicitation and evaluation guidelines. And some of the prioritization criteria that are in those guidelines actually come directly from the bond. So that's um, some of the background for 
the way we do these grants, which is a little bit different from how the Coastal Conservancy has done other grants. Uh, again, eligible projects have to go through a several different kinds of filters. First of all, they have to be eligible under Prop 1, the source of the funding. They have to be eligible uh, for funding with the Coastal Conservancy's project selection criteria. Those are criteria that our board adopted and that all our projects have to meet. Uh, the bond requires that they promote and implement state plans and policies, and we include some links to those to help you kind of make that case in your application. And then there needs to be an eligible grantee and the project itself needs to be eligible for bond funding. So eligible grantees for Prop 1 are nonprofit organizations and local or state governments uh, federal gov and tribes. Federal government agencies are not eligible. Um, and then eligible for bond funding typically means that there has to be a capital improvement something that is actually being built that will kind of last, that is because we're investing bond funds in, so we can't pay for our operations and maintenance and those kinds of things. Um, so we encourage you to look, it's included in both, in the um, project sol proposal solicitation package, we include our grant scoring and evaluation criteria and because we have to score these against the adopted criteria, we encourage you to read those when you are writing your application. Um, and just to kind of highlight it, some of the priorities that, that come from Prop 1 and are included in there, again, advancing the purposes of this bond, that it leverages funding, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The project, we're looking for projects with the greatest public benefit that use the best available science, that use uh, innovative technology or practices and that benefit disadvantaged communities. And for this, um, disadvantaged communities are defined as um, by just an income. It's not the Cal and Viro screen, it's just an income um, criteria. Oops, the wrong way. So um, some basic kind of advice for applying for a grant, um, you are, Encouraged to send us an email before you apply, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, once you've applied, we can't um, we can't consult with you. So the, sort of we go into the scoring um, phase. Uh, as I mentioned, we encourage you to look at the scoring criteria. Our grant application asks you for um, latitude and longitude. The easiest way to do that is to just open Google Maps and put your cursor over your project location, and if you right click, you get latitude and longitude, and if you just copy those numbers exactly the way Google gives them to you into our application, then we can map them in our GIS. So that would be great. Um, we also, as I said, there's advantages for projects in disadvantaged communities, and we have a link in the application to the websites that show where those disadvantaged communities are mapped. Um, matching funds. Our criteria that our board adopted only looks at non-state match funds, so funds from other state agencies, since it's all the state of California paying for it, we don't score that as a match. You can certainly show it in the budget, but just in terms of getting the extra points, it needs to be non-state match, but we do include in-kind um, in that. And we also are okay if you include funds that you've applied for but haven't yet had awarded. Um, just explain to us what the, what the status is so we can understand the funding picture of the project. Uh, and then finally, planning projects are eligible, but in your application you need to explain your plan for how you're going to actually implement the plan if we're funding just the planning portion. So this is the grant application checklist. Um, our grant application is just a Microsoft Word document, um, so fill that out. Uh, send us just one PDF with all of your maps and plans and photos. And then for restoration and ecosystem protection projects, the Prop 1 requires that you consult with the Conservation Corps as to whether or not they can assist in the project. Um, and if they can, they need to be included in your application. 
So there's a consultation form and it's linked in our grant application. And we encourage you to, since presumably all of the projects in this round would be ecosystem restoration projects, um, we encourage you to do that consultation early in the process. And then for nonprofit organizations, the Conservancy requires a nonprofit pre-award questionnaire. Uh, you need to submit that to us once every two years. So if you've already submitted this to us, you can just tell us when you submitted it, um, but you can also just fill it out again, and that's also linked in the grant application. Uh, so as I mentioned, you are welcome to consult with us before you apply, and the best way to do that is to send an email to Karen Gear, and her email is here. It's also in the proposal solicitation. Uh, and be patient, because obviously after this, <laughs> she may get a little inundated with, with emails, but we will try and get back to you. So here are some of the questions we usually get about our Prop 1 grants. And then after that, I will answer any questions uh, that you type into the question box. Um, first, is there a maximum or minimum grant award? The answer is no. Uh, second, will we have other Prop 1 rounds covering other parts of the state this year? And the answer to that is yes. We're still working out that schedule, um, but we will be having more rounds this year. Uh, third, I mentioned this, but we often get asked if we'll fund planning. The answer is yes, uh, but we do want to see a coherent strategy for how you will fund implementation. And Prop 1 funds as bond funds, we won't grant them for planning that does not directly lead to project implementation. So like a regional plan, something that's not tied into a specific on the ground project probably wouldn't be eligible. Um, so can applicants apply for multi-phase projects? The answer is yes, um, but your application should be for a specific project. It's fine to describe the big, big vision and other phases, but help us understand what exactly our money is going to fund and what would result from that. Sometimes it gets a little confused. Uh, we often get asked if there's a geographic division of the of the Prop 1 funds within the bond, and there is not. Um, can you be reimbursed for costs prior to the grant award? The answer to that is no. And to be clear, applications are due on April 1st. And we'll go through, we'll score them and go through a review process, but grants are not awarded until they're approved by the Coastal Conservancy Board at a public meeting. So there's a process um, for that grant award to take place, and then we need to enter into a grant agreement with you. And then after that is when you can get reimbursed for uh, work. Uh, so how much funding do we have left? We have about six million in this round. Uh, is land acquisition eligible? Yes, is the conservancy, I mentioned this, but we are coordinating with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Ocean Protection Council Wildlife Conservation Board. I skipped a number, but anyway. <laughs> the conservancy funds a variety of projects, including public access. Will these projects be eligible for Prop 1? The answer to that is really maybe. Um, your projects in this round, they, they really have to have wetland restoration or anadromous fish benefits. But if you have a multi-benefit project that includes public access designed into a wetland restoration, that, that's great. Um, but because of the source of the funding and the purpose of that, we really have to tie it back to, to those purposes. Um, and then the last one is, do we need to complete CEQA or have permits in order to apply for a grant? The answer to that is no. Um, but if you're applying for implementation funds, you would have to have your CEQA completed before the Conservancy could award the grant. So um, we can review an application while that CEQA is underway, but we wouldn't be able to award the grant until that CEQA document is complete because our funding needs to be covered by by CEQA. And that is the end of our very short presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the little question box. There are some in here already. I'm just going to make sure there's none. Okay. 
Um, and I will read them and try, oops, hold on. Okay, try and answer them. Um, first question is, would Sonoma Creek, very hard to get this little box to open. Would Sonoma Creek that flows to San Pablo Bay be part of the priority area for this round, or is it only focusing on waterways that go to the Pacific? Only waterways that go to the Pacific. Um, municipality looking to submit an inland acquisition project, two creeks on the property, project meant to protect a watershed. Do these fit as a strong application? Um, it's a little bit hard to tell from that description if it's a strong application. I think that the trick would be whether or not there's um, benefits to coastal wetlands or anadromous fish habitat. Um, yeah, I think the if an acquisition was, was, it sounds like that's further inland, um, you'd really need to be able to make a strong link to the importance for anadromous fish or if there was some large wetland component to the, to the property being acquired. Otherwise, it'd be kind of hard to fit it into this grant round. Uh, the next question is, do nonprofits need to send the questionnaire for the pre-consultation? No, we just need to see it as part of that application. And to be clear, the purpose of the questionnaire really is we've had we had um, a couple of small nonprofits that just didn't have the administrative procedures in place and got in trouble after they had spent state grant funds. So we wanted to have this questionnaire so that we can help identify and maybe help you solve problems before you start administering state funds because state bond funds. Um, come with some obligations, you will probably get audited or you certainly may be audited. And we just want to be sure that we're setting up um, nonprofit partners to succeed in that. So that, that's the purpose. Um, I missed the first few slides. Which counties the solicitation covers? It covers coastal watersheds from uh, the Golden Gate to the Oregon border. So Northern California, um, watersheds that drain directly to the coast. Okay. Can multiple watersheds be addressed in one application? Yes. Yes. Is there a specific portion of funding allocated for planning versus implementation? No. When will the next round of funding and do you know what the focus will be? I don't, we're still working on it. I think it will be the Central Coast. We're gonna work our way down. Um, and I think it will be later this spring, but we're still finalizing those dates. Um, but there won't be another North Coast round this year. Right, this is the only North Coast round this year. If proposals for this grant are similar, the same as past grant ones, will a previous consultation with the core suffice? I don't think so. Um, this was this was a mandate written into Prop 1. Um, we, we certainly didn't choose this process, and I think you have to consult with them. Hopefully, it's the consultation will go quickly, but I think you have to consult with them for every application. Yeah, and because I, I think it's also sometimes a question of capacity for the core, so they may have said yes one time and no another. So yeah. It's important to check back in with them. Is there a preferred size for a wetland project to be considered? Are inland wetlands okay that don't flow to the coast? You know, I don't know if there's a preferred size, but certainly if they're very small, it, you know, probably given the resources of the North Coast wouldn't wouldn't rank particularly highly. If, if it's a wetland that doesn't have some sort of connection to the coast, it's a little challenging as well because our programs are for coastal wetlands. So I guess it depends, you know, how, how far from the coast is it? Is, there, is it important like on the Pacific Coast Flyway or is there that kind of, if it's way up a watershed, I think that would be a harder argument to make. Are bays included in the geography, Bodega Bay, Humboldt Bay? Yes. yes. Would San Francisco Bay tributaries fit into the next round? Uh, it just depends on where the next round is focused. I think if we're doing the Central Coast, um, it probably won't. 
part of the reason that we're focusing on the North Coast, for example, this time is because we haven't funded as much, we haven't spent as much Prop 1 in the North Coast, and we have already spent a great deal of Prop 1 in the Bay Area. Um, for planning proposals, how detailed should the funding strategy be for implementation? I think you need to have a reasonable idea that you would end up with a project that's fundable. So, I, yeah. so I think in terms of planning proposals, what we don't want, I mean, sometimes we get applications or, or requests to apply for projects that are really sort of a feasibility study or a science analysis that's going to inform a later study that will inform a later design. And so the farther you step back from actually sort of moving into an implementable project, the less we, fundable it is under this bond program. And also I would say the more expensive the implementation is, our board does sometimes, if we're funding a final design or plan for a pretty expensive project and there's no clear strategy for how we're gonna actually fund the implementation of it, we have to convince our board that it's a good use of public money to do that design and permitting. And so it will help us if there is even if it's not super detailed, but at least there is a strategy of we're going to implement this, you know, right. this way through these different funding sources. You don't have to have applied for them, but we just need to know that there's going to be, that the, the planning money won't be wasted. And, and given the focus of this round being either anadromous fish or coastal wetlands, there are other programs out there that we're aware of that like to fund a lot of implementation, like Department of Fish and Wildlife, like National Coastal Wetlands, like um, WCB. So, you know, it's it's looking at what sort of programs are out there that you think the project might be eligible for. That's, we're wanting to know that you're thinking that through now. The next question, does a planning project need to produce 100% plans? No. Um, but as Karen said, you know, um, the further away you get from final design, the, the more we need to understand, like, that there is going to be a project at the end of the day. But you certainly, you can fund. We have funded conceptual design, 30% 30 design. 30 design, that's fine. Uh, is the slide deck today available on the web? It will be posted um, as soon as I figure out how to do that, so probably sometime this week. Um, it, might t it might need some help. And I think that is the, those are the last questions I see. Does anyone else have any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Get a half an hour back.